Next up, I'd like to invite Dr. Joseph, who um, out of his busy day has every two weeks uh, um, been able to inform us of the newest stuff that's going on with COVID. In fact, I'm intensely interested, uh, Dr. Joseph, what you're hearing about from vaccinations to trends. Um, so welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As always, it's an honor. Uh, I always enjoy these and it makes me so proud of our community. I, I'm uh, just the, you know, the unending dedication of Supervisor Anderson. And then today, you know, to, to hear about fire protection, police services, emergency preparedness. Uh, we have so much in our community to be grateful for. And certainly that goes to you as well, Mr. Mayor. So thank you for the invitation and it's an honor to be here. Uh, Steve, if you will help me uh, share the screen, we'll see what we get. And hopefully this is the first slide and everyone is seeing it. Just a, a, a little bit about COVID today and then we'll allow time for any other comments. Uh, these are the topics that I'm going to address just a little bit, something about wastewater surveillance that has, uh, has become quite an important thing, a little bit about newer testing and vaccine and then some science as why do those who have underlying diseases appear to get sicker and have a higher mortality than those who are younger and getting sick. So let's talk first about wastewater testing. The concept here is that virus particles, not necessarily living virus, but virus particles can be recovered from sewage and it can be recovered from sewage that identifies what is going on in a particular community. I've, I've mentioned this here before and, and it, we just must address uh, the East Bay Municipal Utility District. They have been on the forefront of this for months. As a matter of fact, our own East Bay MUD is coordinating a study with 10 different counties where sampling is done the, the samples are being sent to Stanford and the results of what we're seeing in different communities around our Bay Area, or at least in those 10 counties, should be, at, should be forthcoming. But, but a big shout out to East Bay Mud for being very, very much involved with this from the beginning. Now with the information that they have generated and with some of the science behind it, universities have got uh, into this. And Syracuse developed a protocol. And what you see here is a drain pipe in a dormitory uh, at Syracuse University, where twice weekly, they sample the sewage coming from the dormitory and test it for the presence of coronavirus. This has been adopted by many schools. And one example of how this has worked was the University of Arizona. Last week, or at least on August 28th, for the first time in a particular dormitory, they identified that the sewage was positive for coronavirus. Their response was to test everybody living in that dormitory, and they identified two students who were asymptomatic, meaning that they were carrying and shedding coronavirus, but they were not sick. Those two individuals were quarantined, and they are convinced, and I agree with them, that by identifying this early, they uh, avoided an outbreak, not only in that dormitory, but also in the surrounding communities. One of the problems that's occurring in colleges that is now quite clear is when there is an outbreak of the student body, it's spreading over into the local townships and communities. So policies like this are extremely effective and represent only one of the many things that science is doing to try to curtail this and identify it early. A little bit about testing. This is really, really important. Quick tests are here and more are coming. On August 26, the FDA authorized a test called Binax Now. This is an antigen test. It's a very quick test. It takes about 15 minutes. It only costs about $5 and it identifies the coronavirus. It is a nasal swab and it's the first antigen test to be authorized by the FDA that doesn't require confirmation. In other words, a negative is a negative, a positive is a positive. 
This is not a PCR test. Those take a lot of resources, a lot of time, long turnaround. This is one that can be done in 15 minutes. Now, I want to comment on that term there that says CLIA waived. This is something that, that is important to understand. CLIA is the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. That is the federal government amendments that are designed to make laboratory results reliable. So if, if someone sends a test to one of my laboratories and we do a test and report it back to the doctor, that test better be good, better be accurate, and can be used for making patient decisions. Now, in my laboratories, we have a lot of very sophisticated and, and well-educated persons. But there is a concept of tests that are so simple, almost bulletproof, that they can be done anywhere. And an example of that is diabetics checking their own blood sugar by a finger stick. You don't need to go to an accredited or certified laboratory to get a blood sugar. And that's what CLIA waived means. The test is bulletproof. Anybody can do it. And this particular test is the very first one that is waived. In other words, this can be done in doctor's offices, school nurses, pharmacy, on site. And the term that is used is point of care. In other words, where the patient shows up, the test can be done immediately with a result in 15 minutes. This is groundbreaking. This is a game changer. All of us have been looking for this. I have been talking about this. It is now out. When Abbott released this, they, they even said over here on the right that they're going to have a phone app that connects to your results so that if TSA or other areas, whether it's a college or travel or airlines require confirmation of your test results, you can show them your test results after having had this test. So Abbott has committed to 150 million tests being available before the end of 2020. And because of the importance of this, the federal government will be determining where they go. Now, this is the first one, and I believe this is appropriate. They will be going to schools, colleges, first responders, any place we need a very rapid, reliable, quick turnaround. But the, and the, the two important comments are, this is here, it's available, I've used it, it's superb, and more are coming. This is what every research laboratory is doing. So excellent results about sewage testing, excellent results about quick testing. And, and I have said to all of you so many times, if you can test everybody in 15 minutes, you can solve the problem. If everybody shows up for school and can be tested in 15 minutes and you know who's positive and who's not, that is the game changer. That's the safety factor. And we are here with more coming soon. Extremely exciting news. Now, a vaccine update. There is a lot going on with vaccines. Over in the left, you can see that there are over 150 products being tested in, in the laboratory and in animal studies. But there are 47 human clinical trials going on now. And I've put the phases up there because I think it's easier to understand with this little cartoon. Phase one is the earliest. And there's 24 different companies, 24 different products, 24 different vaccines being tested. Phase two is, is the next step. That is, if phase one looks good and it's safe and you know how much to give, then it goes to phase two. And phase three are the large scale trials. Nine of them going on now worldwide. Large scale is 15,000 persons. That's 15,000 individuals getting the vaccine, 15,000 individuals getting a placebo, and you follow them to see what happens. That's where we are now. This is really moving very quickly. And it's important to say that none are yet approved but we are getting close. I, I'm not an individual who make a prediction 
Uh, you know, I also say if you want a prediction, you can turn on uh, YouTube or the news. Uh, I'll leave that to others, but I can say this is extremely promising because of the number of companies working on vaccines, the brilliance of the science behind it, somebody is going to hit the lottery. Somebody's going to make it just like somebody got the first quick test. This is exciting. So regarding vaccine, because this is coming, because we know that this is likely to work, the, the CDC, uh, with which I'm very much involved, released a message. And this, I, I was aware of this message before it came out, but it did get a little bit confusing. So I wanted to state it. The CDC said, that is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC said to all states, get ready. Not it's going to happen, but build the infrastructure. Like it was talked earlier about what we did for swine flu when we, had, when we were giving vaccines all over the area. The message is out, get ready, because we may have a vaccine as early as November 1st. If we don't, we're gonna have it in December. If we don't, we're gonna have it in January. This is the messaging. Build the infrastructure because when a vaccine becomes available, we want to be prepared, be prepared to deploy it as quickly as possible. This just represents our experience with COVID. We know what to plan for, very similar to the, uh, excuse me, one sorry, very similar to the, the messaging that was done earlier. Be prepared and, and then when the time comes, we can deploy it quickly. So this also is extremely exciting news. And now I'll spend a couple of minutes of questions that I think uh, are prevalent in our community, at least questions that I get. Why the heck do young kids do so good and those with underlying diseases or advanced age do so poor? What's going on? And what you see on the left is a college COVID party these are parties that are not, uh, not to be done, but they do occur. Young kids together without distancing, without masking, large numbers of them do get COVID. Their COVID parties were 70 to 80% of the people that are there will get sick, but they do great. I, I've shown the figures before. The, the, the hospitalization rate is, is a fraction of a percent. The, the morbidity, the mortality, the seriousness is a fraction of a percent of those kids on the left. And what, what's going on on the right? This is the same virus, the same disease, the same method of getting it, that is person to person spread. And you see a person, an individual there in the intensive care unit requiring mechanical ventilation, ventilator support, vasopressor support, very, very critically ill. So let's talk a little bit about what is the difference between those who don't get sick and those who do? Well, it's our immune system. And very simply stated, our immune system is what keeps us alive throughout our lives. The immune system has a start and a stop. Now think of it as a thermostat in your house. If you have your thermostat set to 68 degrees and the temperature goes to 65, your furnace will start. And when it gets to 68, it will stop. It starts, it does its job, it turns on, and it stops. This is good. And what I'm showing here are a very typical viral infection, a viral infection importantly because we don't have antibiotics. We rely on our immune system for us to get over viruses. Colds, flu, runny nose, sinusitis, bronchitis, all of those are viruses. Measles, mumps, rubella, all of those are viruses. We don't have antibiotics. So the first thing that happens on the left is that the immune system turns on and it attacks the virus. And that is called an inflammatory response. This is a really, really, good thing. Fever, chills, aches, tiredness, feeling terrible, feeling like you got hit by a dump truck. 
that's a good thing. You don't want to hear me say it, but it's a good thing. It's not the virus that's causing the fever or the chills. It's the immune system that's causing the fever and chills. Proteins are released. Chemicals are released. The inflammatory response is turned on and our inflammatory response goes and kills that virus. That's a good thing. I never treat a fever for someone who has a viral syndrome because the fever is an important part of controlling it. Now, what happens after our innate, inherent, good, inflammatory response attacks the virus, and it could be COVID in a, in a younger person, it could be influenza, it could be just a runny nose. When it kills the virus, when it kills the cells in our body that are harboring the virus, it turns off. The inflammatory response turns off just like the furnace turns off. Its job is to ramp up, kill the virus, and shut down. That is a normal, healthy, good immune system. The difference between individuals with underlying disease, individuals with advanced age, is that the brakes go bad. The immune system turns on just like it does in a younger person, a college student, a high school kid, but it doesn't turn off. So the inherent change in the immune system is that it gets started like it's supposed to, starts normally, attacks the virus, but then it keeps going. Even after it kills the virus, we lose the brakes. And that is the reason for the complications of COVID. We don't have a treatment for this. This is a recognized problem, but it's why elderly people, those with cardiac disease, kidney disease, diabetes, lung disease, this is why they get so sick. So you can see what happens. On the left here is a normal chest x-ray. This is what I would see every day. The dark areas are good. The next one, is a COVID patient. This is long after the virus is gone. This is the uncontrolled inflammatory response attacking the cells where the virus used to be. The COVID virus used to be here in the lungs. The COVID virus is gone. It takes about seven days. It's completely disappeared, but the inflammatory response continues. And this has been tagged an uncontrolled immune response, sometimes a malignant immune response, or the term cytokine storm because the cytokine is the protein that is responsible for the attack of the inflammation. So in the bottom right, you see somebody in the intensive care unit. What happens is that every place the coronavirus goes, can be a victim of the uncontrolled inflammatory response. So it's not just the lungs, but it can be the brain. A third of the people who have COVID, it affects the heart. Well, in a young person, when the virus is gone and the inflammatory system shuts off, the heart comes back to normal. In an elderly person where the brakes go bad, where the inflammation doesn't stop, it continues to do heart damage, and that's every major organ, liver, kidneys, spleen, muscles, brain, vascular tree. And that's why we can have a fraction of a percentage of a mortality rate in young kids. But if that same virus goes to grandpa, the mortality rate can be as high as 8 to 10 percent. One out of 10 might die. So that's the underlying science of why we all know that those with advanced disease have a much more serious response. And so I'll, I'll wrap it up today with, with just a couple of comments. What I've, what I've nailed as eight quick COVID thoughts. Things you've heard, let me emphasize. The worst place you want to be is in a room indoors with unfiltered, recirculated air. This is what every school, every college, every uh, shopping mall is considering. 
unfiltered recirculated air is bad, outdoor is good. The, the third point, still, most COVID is spread by exhaled air from those who harbor the virus. Surfaces are possible, doorknobs are possible, but it is a fraction of what we are seeing from person to person spread. This is a person to person disease. And masks and double layered cotton protect others from you if you happen to be exhaling the virus. And it's now known that it protects you from others. So wear a doggone mask, cover your face, and you will protect others as well as you. Uh, just a little fact, recently last week we, we did a study with a bunch of frontline healthcare workers in several communities in the United States. We found that 600 of them had been infected. That's what the antibody positive means. At some time, they had been infected and 400 of them didn't know it. Now, these are individuals who are educated. These are healthcare workers. They are educated to be very aware of symptoms, emphasizing the very large number of people who get infected, shed virus, but don't know it. Number six, reinfections are here. We, I, I've said at this and many other meetings so far, we have not identified a person who has been infected twice. That is infected once, gets better, and gets an infection with a different strain. We now know of at least four people around the world, two in the United States. This tells us that the immunity may be short-lived. We don't know, but they are here. So once infected does not mean lifelong immunity. It does not mean permanent immunity. As a matter of fact, more likely than not, it's temporary immunity. I want to comment on this last one, and this is not my, uh, my comment. This comes from Dr. Fauci. We often wonder, why don't people wear masks? Why do college kids have COVID parties? Why are some people compliant? Why are others not? And this is the society we live in. We have chosen to live in an independent society. This is our choice. Unless there is a law, a mandate, or an order, we have the ability to decide what we want to do for ourselves. And in general, mandates and orders are to protect others. And this is just what we have chosen to do. And what we are going through in COVID, whether we like what our neighbors are doing or we don't like it, is exactly what happened in the 1918 flu epidemic. It was the same thing. Some cooperated and some didn't. And then last, Mr. Mayor, is my plug for my field, good science. Good science is self-correcting. And what I mean by that is that I may have told you something in February that represents the best of good science in February. But as new information comes out, we make new recommendations. The fact that in, in March, it was stated that we do not need universal face coverings. But in May, we learned how valuable it was. So I attempt with everything I do every day to practice good science, realize that what I tell you today represents the best that I can put together a consensus conference from my colleagues, from people that I have a lot of respect, but it may be self-correcting. We may have to change our mind as more information continues to become available. And with that, sir, I will stop. Thank you very, very much for the time. As I said, I'm very proud to be in this community and I thank you and thank everyone on the panel. Dr. Joseph, I think that was one of the best 20 minutes or so I've spent in quite a long time. That was amazing information, some new stuff that, by the way, I don't think anybody has learned elsewhere, at least not in the mainstream media. I wish every American could have watched the last 20 minutes of your presentation and we'd be better served as a community. Um, thank you. The people understood what was going on, understood some of the things that are happening, which are really encouraging putting in context the virus, but also more important, talking about good behaviors and 
what we should be doing to help protect others. So Dr. Joseph, thank you. Outstanding stuff. Thank you, sir. And at this stage, I'm going to look to Steve. I'm sure there may be a few questions for our guests. Uh, so for Dr. Joseph, uh, when would you recommend having a seasonal flu shot? Uh, yeah, th this is really a challenging question. Uh, because seasonal flu in the East Coast starts earlier than seasonal flu in the West Coast. Uh, our peak season in California is typically uh, December, but then more importantly, January, February, March. In the East Coast, it's typically three months prior to that. Yet the timing of flu shots comes out nationally. So last year for the first time uh, at the CDC, we were able to stagger the recommendations. So I'm, I'm sorry about the long-winded prelude, but for Californians, October is a great time. Uh, 10 years ago, I used to give flu shots on Halloween and, and then we had difficulties where it was a global recommendation that you had to have them before September 1st, and, and it was problematic. And I should say that the problem is that flu shot immunity is short-lived. So we know that the average duration of the immune response to a flu shot is 120 to 150 days. So the quick answer to your question is we're now back to where we were a decade ago, flu shots mid to late October unless we hear of a rapid flu season. But if we get what we normally get mid to late October. Great, and, and Dr. Joseph, on the next question, I know you've addressed this partially or, or actually fully on, on other uh, broadcasts, but are there any new treatment options available on the horizon? Is, are there any uh, promising uh, procedures that, are, that, that have a good outlook for treating COVID? Many promising treatments for the most seriously ill. Um, it, it may be um, unnecessary to mention the exact drugs, but in line of what I said before, that if we consider that the people who are dying, the people who are in the intensive care unit, and those who are on breathing machines are due to an uncontrolled immune response, the mainstay of therapy now are drugs to turn that off. So they are drugs that block the immune response and they are very promising. Nothing for the outpatient, nothing for the, the individual with less severe illness is on the forefront. Okay, um, we have a, a time for a couple more and they're, they're both for Dr. Joseph. Um, there are several vaccine trials underway in the Bay Area. What questions should residents ask when considering whether to join a vaccine trial? There should be no questions left to ask. So in, in an, a, a clinical vaccine trial, everything should be explained up front. To do these, a the, the patient has to sign what is known as a patient's bill of rights. And it's 10 points that explains, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if I'm going to have side effects. Previous studies have suggested it's safe. But what we're doing right now is an attempt to prove that it's safe. So I don't think there's any questions left to ask. It's really down to an individual's preference. Do I want to try something and, and take a chance that I'm going to get early immunity earlier than others, or do I want to wait? But there should be no questions left that an individual has to think of. Great. And the, uh, the final question was related to the new, uh, the new test that you outlined in your, um, in your presentation. Uh, what kind of nasal swab is it? Is it the one that has to go way up in there or is it kind of more of a surface nasal, nasal swab? Uh, almost everybody, we, we were the, you know, the long one that we did uh, three to four months ago is, has been called the brain biopsy. Yeah. You know, it's where you take a pencil and you jam it in your nose as far as you can. Uh, these are those are pretty much gone we're now using mid turbinate so it goes in about two and a half inches the swab has a stop it's not right in the front of the nose so not just ringing around the front of the nose but going in about two and a half inches not very uncomfortable at all that's what that test is using 